finishing well in the final days that we're in. In 2 Peter chapter 1, the apostle was writing the church and telling them the keys to finishing well and how to, how to get to that place in your life where you, you're, 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 you're victorious and you're useful and you're fruitful in your Christian walk in life. And that's what we want to continue to look at today as we look at part three in our series of messages. If you've missed the last two or three, this is, we'll catch you up real quick, all right? But let's look at these verses. These are the verses we'll be looking at not only today, but for several weeks to come. And uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 11, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything. That's a big statement getting ready to make. He's granted to us everything pertains to life and godliness through the true, true knowledge of him who's called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these, that's his glory and his excellence, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. Now for this very reason, if I'm not where I need to be, let me know here in a minute. For this very reason, goes on to says in verse five, I find it back in here. Uh, apply also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence knowledge and in your knowledge, self-control and in your self-control, perseverance. In your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But for he who lacks these, these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Now, those are some powerful words. If you're paying any little attention at all, there ought to be some things about these verses that just grab you by your, by your collar and say, what? You know, what? Well, I think some are like, we, we can participate in the divine nature, like you say in verses two and three. We, and, and, and God's called us and we're part of his family. And then he's given us these promises. And with those promises, I can participate in his very nature and his lifestyle. And then he goes on to say, if I take my faith and add to my faith, and he lists these seven qualities, he says, you do this and, they, and you grow in these and you increase in this, then you'll never stumble. Well, those are, some, those are some powerful words. In fact, as we look at today, the motivation for everything that we're teaching here is found in verse eight when he, when he makes that statement about, hey, that in, you know, we can, if these things are, are ours, he says, if their qualities are yours and they're increasing, they render you neither useless nor fruitless, all right? Or unfruitful. And you'll, you won't stumble. I don't know about you, but that sounds like quite an offer to me. The last thing I want in my life is to always be stumbling to be useless in the kingdom of God and unfruitful. When all through scripture, God is telling me there's a better life, there's a higher life, there's a greater life, there's, there, there, there's, a, there's an abundant life, there's a peace that passes understanding, there's a joy that's full of glory. Uh, come on, bring it on. I want, I want that in my life. I, I don't want to lag behind that. So here he's given us a, a and a motivation, but at the same time, he's giving us the method by which these things become re reality. He tells us for this very reason, supply, apply all diligence in your faith, supply, we talked about moral excellence or virtue last week, and in your virtue, knowledge. And it, this is just the, the second of these elements really today as we're in this, this part three of the sermon about what he's telling us to add to our faith. Remember, first of all, you have to add to your faith. You gotta know Christ. There's this, you can't escape the fact that there needs to be a personal relationship established. It's all about fellowshipping with God. It's all about knowing God. It's all about experiencing God in your life and knowing him personally. And he says, so you start with that. Okay, it doesn't stop there. We, we talked about that last week. That's just the starting point. That's, that's not where we, we get in there, but we don't get off there, all right? We get in and we start moving forward into the kingdom. It, it, it's like, that's the doorway, my faith relationship with Jesus but now that I've entered into the doorway, there's something else that needs to happen. And he says, you need to take this faith that you've been given now, your faith in Jesus Christ, 
and apply all diligence. We talk about, it has to do with, let's get after it. It's the words, we get our word speed from spudo in the Greek language. Get, get busy here. You know, yeah, it's faith by grace. You're saved by grace. You know God by grace. You're going to die and go to heaven by grace. You experience fullness of life by grace. Hey, but if you really want to succeed in your spiritual life, then it's, it's, it's you becoming, well, Paul told the Corinthians, we are co-laborers with God. All right? Well, there's, there's a part for us. God's done a part. Now we have a part. We're not saved by our part. He's done all that part. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But now that we are children of God, that we're supposed to be building, we're supposed to be moving forward, we're supposed to have a life that makes the difference in the world around us. And he just lays it out pretty, pretty simple here, what has to happen. In fact, there's about five important facts about, about knowledge I want us to pick up on here and, and, and get a grip on today. And I think that we'll understand what it means to add to my faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, because it's not just a little bit of information. I mean, we had to have knowledge of Jesus, that we had to know the gospel, and knowing the gospel, we get saved. But that's not the end of all knowledge. That's just the beginning of the knowledge that we have to have in Jesus Christ. But I do want you to understand, as he deals with each one of these, they are in the order they are in for a specific reason. You can't add one before the other. You start here. You start with faith in Jesus Christ. You move from your faith relationship with Jesus Christ. You move into virtue. Remember we talked about that moral excellence and out of that moral excellence comes integrity. Out of that moral excellence comes character. That's the word the Greeks use for heroism, you know, that out of that, out of that came a, a person who's heroic in their faith, so to say. They, they have a, a life that means something. It had to do with a, with a fortitude for life to be able to meet the challenges of life. Where's that come from? Well, my faith in Jesus Christ, I've taken that and I've added to it virtue. And all through the scriptures you see People who come to Christ and faith in Christ, one of the first things the New Testament, in fact, much of the Old Testament deals with, after I meet Jesus, I need to get my life straight, all right? You know, I don't get my life straight to come to Jesus. I repent of my sins and then start working on my life, all right? Uh, I used to think I had to get good enough. You'll never get good enough, all right? Because the measure by which we measure our goodness is God, and I can't reach that. We've all fallen short of that. But now that I've come to Christ, virtue's the first step. I need to clean up my life. I need to be careful about what I, what I entertain, what I, what I do with my eyes and what I allow my ears to hear by, and raise a strong moral standard of the word of God in my life that I'm gonna live by this standard of God's, God's righteousness and God's morality. And so I'm willing to deal with those issues. In fact, you read in the, in the New Testament, you start looking in uh, 2 Peter, it deals a lot with apostasy. All right, so he's dealing with the true knowledge first and he starts dealing with the fake believers in the rest of this, this letter. And he says, one of the characteristics of the apostates is people who don't really know Jesus is, is their life is filled with immorality. All right, they put on a good show, he says. They sound good, they look good, but when you, you know, it, well, it's like the Pharisees. Jesus said, you know, you guys have made white the outside of the sepulcher, it's inside you're still full of dead men's bones. He said, you sneak into widow's house and you begin to accuse them of their immoral standards and immoral life. Paul, he writes to Corinthians and the Ephesians and almost all his letters, he deals with this issue that once we come to faith, we need to get our, 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 our moral life right, you know, and have a moral standard by which we live in. We don't open ourselves up to all the vain things of this world and the pornography and the, and, and, and the, and the garbage that's out there. You draw, you draw a line. You say, well, how do you do that? There's only one way to deal with that, all right? And, and that's by the Bible puts it away, flee. That's the only way you can deal with it. You can't, you can't barter with the devil in this regard, in this area of your life, all right? You can't, you can't think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just get more information. No, it deals, one thing, run. Get it behind you. Flee adultery, flee youthful lust. Over and over through scriptures, you see it. But I thought it was interesting that there's a lot of people in scripture who, who have a lot of information, but they don't have a changed heart in life. They haven't dealt with that issue of adding a moral standard and moral integrity to their life, and they, they, they tend to fall very quickly. So let's look at the, when he says, I need to add to my virtue, my faith, first of all, virtue. So I have a, I'm a believer. Now I'm going to start moving forward and have a virtuous walk. And out of that, I'm going to find strength and fortitude. That's got to be first. Then I have what I need to move forward to the next step. And what you'll see as we go through these seven words over the next few weeks, each one builds upon the other. If you skip one, it's all going it, to, it's going to fall like a house of cards, right? Because there's no foundation. Foundation is ultimately Jesus. Then my faith relationship, you gotta settle that. Make your calling and election sure, he tells them. Make sure that you know that you know Jesus Christ. And now that you've done that, you move forward and you deal with this issue of your morality. And he says, as you deal with that, and it's an ongoing thing, by the way, you're not gonna conquer this in a day. But as you deal with that, you're adding to your, your virtue, 
knowledge. So let's talk a little bit about knowledge today and, and, and see what the scripture has to say. First of all, you know, the Bible makes it clear that uh, this, this knowledge is not just worldly knowledge. It's the knowledge of God's word. All right. It's what does the Bible have to say? What does God have to say about all the issues of my life? It, you know, you've got to know you cannot grow. It's impossible to grow if you don't know the word of God. And it's impossible, I really believe, to, to move forward and have a life of obedience if you don't know the word of God. How are you going to know what to obey if you don't know the word of God? How are you going to know what to trust if you don't know the word of God? How are you going to know where to stand if you don't know the word of God? So it starts here with, it, with, with knowledge. So as a new believer in Christ or as an old believer who's not been practicing these things in my life, I get a grip. I wake up and say, listen, I need to trust God. I need to believe God. But what am I believing? You've got to know what the Bible has to say. If you don't know, you're going to be at a constant and consistent loss in your life. In 2 Peter 3.18, you, maybe you're familiar with this passage, but it says, grow in grace and in knowledge. Grow in what? Grow, grow in knowledge of what? Of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Paul wrote the Colossians in, in chapter 1 verse 9. He said, listen, guys, be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So something's going to have to happen with me in regard to knowledge. I'm going to have to pursue knowledge. I'm going to have to search for knowledge. I'm going to have to study. I'm going to have to, to move forward. It's, it's, it's that word, add to your faith. In other words, it takes an action on my part, which I've got to get knowledge. Where am I going to get knowledge? I'm not going to get it from just sitting and listening to sermons and Bible studies. I need to get in the book of knowledge and find out what does God have to say. In Colossians, Paul wrote, the church, he says, you put on your new self, all right, who's being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. In other words, there is a knowledge, but it's not just knowledge in general. It's the knowledge of God. It's the knowledge of God's word. In 2 Corinthians, it says this, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and in knowledge. A lot of us are abounding so perhaps in faith and some even in utterance, but you've got to have something to utter about. And that's where the knowledge comes in. Numerous times throughout the scripture, you see the apostle telling people to grow in knowledge, to get knowledge, receive knowledge. Don't reject knowledge. Romans 1, 13, Romans 11, 25, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 12, 2 Corinthians 1, 1 Thessalonians 4. Those are just a few of the places in scripture that talk about the importance of you and I getting knowledge, getting, acquiring, studying, believing, receiving God's, God's word and what he has to say. But that is probably the the greatest famine in the church today is a famine of bread, all right? A biblical bread of the word of God and taking the word of God and eating the word of God and receiving the word of God. Hosea put it this way when he's rebuking the people for their ignorance. He said, listen, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. I have often said that I believe most people can continue to struggle with the same things over and over again in their life due to the lack of knowledge. Now, I'm not just talking about information. I'm talking about knowledge of God's word. Most people struggle over the areas of their spiritual identity. They don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know what God has done for them in reality. They don't know what God's done to them and what God wants to do with them and for them and through them because they don't know. All right. And unfortunately, Fortunately, I would say there's a lot of churches that don't spend a lot of time dredging the deep waters of God's word. They don't spend a lot of time in scripture and preaching the word of God and bringing up the word of God. We get a lot of motivational kind of messages that are preached in churches today, you know. But when it comes down to just let's get in the Bible, let's see what God has to say, there's very little of that. Now, I grew up with an understanding of this in, in a way because I had a mom who loved the Bible. I mean, she loved it. She, I mean, I'm talking about really loved it. She read it all the time. I mean, how many times can you read it, Mom? <laughs> you know, it, she, she'd have to get new Bibles just to have more space to write stuff. Underlining, color coding, notes in the outline, pages and pages. Always, oh, if I'd get up in the morning, Mom's Bible would be open. If she wasn't over it, it was still open. Come home in the afternoon, Mom's Bible would be open. Right there at the kitchen and the kitchen table, the kitchen area. And we didn't have an office, all right? We was poor. But she had her little spot, and that's mom's spot. Don't touch that mess, all right? That's her stuff, and it's all in order. It was a disorder order, but it was an order for her. 
You know, I've got, you know, we're getting ready to, TechStot's getting ready to uh, take and appropriate our, our other building in Magnolia, and so we're going to have to move everything. I've got one little storehouse that nothing was in over there. And when mama passed away, I put in file cabinets back in that little storehouse. It was mama's stuff. All right. These were her prized possessions. What are they? File folder after file folder after file folder of 40, 50, 60 years of Bible study. Everything she ever studied, she wrote down. She made notes. I mean, it's just amazing to go through some of the things and just see all just the pouring of her heart and her life into the Word of God. That's what God wants all of us to be like, that we see how valuable this is. What do you say? He's given us these magnificent and precious so we can participate. So what do we need to do? If I want to participate, I take the promises and I begin to know them. I begin to read them. I begin to study them. All right? So I can know God. Now, obviously that's translated as we take the information in there has to be a transformation that takes place but it's not going to take place and I'm not going to grow in grace unless I start growing in some knowledge and getting the information from the word of God so that I can experience the transformation that God wants me to experience in my life but the church today is starving for the word of God People are so ignorant of what the Bible has to say. What's your favorite Bible verse? Cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you hear stuff like that all the time, you know. Yeah. Idle minds the devil's workshop. Can you give me the verse and location of those passages, please? Y'all have heard a bunch of them. And people, it's the Bible. It might be Benjamin, somebody saying the smart stuff, but it ain't the Bible, all right? What does the Bible have to say? I mean, what are you dealing with in your life right now? What's the biggest thing facing you? What decisions there? What crisis might be looming? What kind of a situation are you having to deal with? Do you realize that the Bible has an answer for you? That this word is so complete and so thorough that it covers the whole gamut of your life? I mean, we've been studying Proverbs on Wednesday nights, and man, I, I'm just astounded. And some of those Proverbs just sound like stupidity. I mean, what is he talking about, you know, where there is no ox and the manger is clean? Okay, that's brilliant. What's that mean? You know, I came into a situation the other day, I realized, well, there's no oxen, the, the manger's clean. But I'm not looking for a clean manger in life. I need an ox, <laughs> you know? So if the lazy person doesn't want to clean the, the, where the food goes, is what it means, then, you know, you're not going to have an ox, but you're also going to go without any grain on your own. So there is an application, but hey, if you don't have it in here, it's never going to get here. It's not going to get into where you need it. What, what, what's happening in your life today? What you're dealing with? God's got a word for you. But you have to grow. You have to make this diligent effort that he talks about from the word of God. So point number one very quickly was that, hey, you know, the true knowledge comes from God. John says, you know the truth. You have to have knowledge of the truth before you can be set free. But what happens? When you know and you embrace it, you add it to your faith diligently, guess what? Freedom. You experience freedom in your life. The second point here, true knowledge is found in the Lord, in God himself. Proverbs said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, we've talked about on Wednesday nights, if you're here, we talk about what the fear of the Lord is. Let me give you a very brief, brief, brief summary of what that means. You have a holy respect for who God is. So much so is your respect for God. You pay attention, you respond, it's yes, sir, it's no, sir, whatever you say, sir. I mean, that's the attitude. You realize that there's, there's, there's nobody like God. There's nobody higher than God. There's nobody bigger than God. There's nobody smarter than God. There's nobody more places than God, all right? There's nobody been everywhere but God. And we somehow lose the fact God, big God, he's holy God, he's omniscient. God knows everything, sees all things, hears all things, made all things. And we can know him. We've been invited to know him. But this is where real knowledge comes from. It comes from him. There has to be a, a commitment to him. In Psalms 94, it talks about the, the fact that God is the one who teaches man knowledge. Now, there's a lot of men who have warped the knowledge of God and teach a knowledge we'll see in a moment, but it's not, it's not what we're talking about here. Colossians 2 puts it this way. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So the knowledge is there, but if it's hidden, I got to seek I got to look. Seek and you shall. Don't seek. You don't. Why do most people don't find? They don't seek. Why don't most people live in life and victory? They don't, they don't seek. Paul writes to Timothy and he, he's encouraging him. He said, but hey, Timothy, continue in the things which you've learned, what you know. 
and, and yet you've been assured of because you know of whom you've learned them. And that as a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You want to be wise? You want to be smart? You want to be informed? Hey, it comes through knowing the Word of God. He writes Timothy a few verses later and he says this. He's, he's talking about this Word that we need to know. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? So you can be mature is the word here, perfect, furnished to all good works. What does that mean, thoroughly furnished? It means you have everything you need to do what you've been called to do. How often do we get out to do something? I just don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I have what need to do this. I don't think I can. That's not true if you know the word of God. But most people fail because they're not equipped because they don't pursue knowledge, because they don't seek God's word. They don't see God in his word. Now understand there is a false knowledge that is out there. First Corinthians says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. For years I, I, I'd, I'd done and still do occasionally uh, big youth rallies. And what I've always tried to tell kids in youth meetings and youth rallies was this. You're in a very important part of your life right now. You're at, that, you're at that stage of your life where you're finalizing how you feel about everything. In other words, the, the, the last bricks and the last nails are going into the house of what we might call your philosophy of life. You're setting your philosophy of life, how you feel about the world, how you feel about God, how you feel about, about the future, how you, how you feel about your country, how you feel about your parents, how you feel about people, how you, how you think about men or how you think about women. All that's being developed right now in your life. And you're getting a lot of input into how you should think about stuff. But you have to realize there's two sources of, in, of, of input. There's two databases out there you get your information from. And it's important that you download the right information. There's the database of the world. And God says very clearly, as Paul writes, there's the foolishness of God, which is really the wisdom of God, but the world thinks it's foolish. And then there's the wisdom of the world, which is foolish to God, you know. He said, but most people are buying into the, the wrong database. Most people are buying in, into the wrong set over here of information. And they're getting down all the facts wrong. The way they think about sex, the way they think about the family, the way they think about God, the way they think about church. That whole database of the world is incorrect. And it's information that ultimately leads not to a transformed good life. It leads to destruction in your life. So realize that, hey, you need to realize there is a knowledge that's a true knowledge and uses that terminology here a couple of times in, in uh, chapter one of Second Peter. Paul uses it several times when he talks about true knowledge, true knowledge, true, because there is a false knowledge. In Second Corinthians, here's what happens when we start building up our mindset and we develop ideas that are, are really not the knowledge of God, it's, it's the knowledge of man, all right? It, it's, it's, not, it's not God wisdom, it's, it's man wisdom. It creates problems in our life. Paul wrote to Corinthians, he said, listen, you need to, let me get past that verse. There it is. Second Corinthians, you need to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What does that mean? He's talking about spiritual warfare. And where does spiritual warfare really take place? It takes place in your mind. In other words, Every sin that you commit starts with a temptation. And where does that, where is that temptation formed? In your mind, right? You have this thought, all right? Now, here's what happens. Most people believe everything that comes into their mind <laughs> or everything that they hear. I mean, they grow up with an attitude like, well, that's just the way I am. That's the way my mama was. That's the way my daddy was. That's the way Papa was. And all us Jenkins are like that. <laughs> that's just it. Well, maybe not. No. <laughs> That's just the way we are. We well, see, here's the problem with that. That's false knowledge. Because in Christ, I'm a new creature. I'm a new person in Jesus Christ. I have new roots, all right? I have a new family. You know, the old man's dead. The new man's alive. And so I no longer go back and say, I have to act that way because that's the way I've been taught. I have to act that way because that's the way I've always been. Or I have to be that way because that's what I, you know, I was led to believe. No, all that's gone. We have this new knowledge base. We have this new information site that we go to and we download from that site and we get the right, correct information, which is God's word. And what happens? Then we need to start tearing down those false beliefs. 
Because all that a stronghold is, it's a little fortress of lies. It's a little fortress of false knowledge. It's a little fortress that you've chosen to believe it, but it's wrong. So one thing has to happen. You have to literally destroy it. You have to bring it down. Cast down those imaginations, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What's that mean? Well, I'm doing it this way, but here's what the Bible says. Oh, well, God's way says this. I'm doing it this way. So what I have is not true. What I've been living is not true. What I have is, is, is bad information. And so I'm going to bring that down to Jesus and I'm going to embrace true knowledge. I'm going to base not. Well, how do I get that true knowledge? It comes from the word of God. So there is a false knowledge. The fourth point is, is, is this. Any knowledge that we receive should be transformative. It ought to change our lives. I'll catch up to this in a moment. It ought to be something that really supernaturally works in our life. You know, it ought to be something that, that once it's taken in, that, that does, a, does a, a work of change in my life. James is writing the church says, who's this wise man? I mean, who has the knowledge? Who's endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation. That's the word for lifestyle. His works, his actions with meekness and wisdom. He said, if, in other words, if you're so smart concerning godly things, the way you treat people, the way you act, the way you speak, the way you live, your life's gonna be different. I know this is hard when we start really listening to it. It is for me, all right? Okay, my flesh opposes this. I have another knowledge base, all right, that fights this, all right? But where, where, am, I gonna, where am I gonna move to? Where am I gonna stand? Where am I gonna believe? James said, hey, if, this, if you're due with wisdom, then it's gonna be manifest in the way you've lived your life. Knowledge should be transforming. Now, that's the knowledge of God's word. What about the world's knowledge? It is, but it's not transforming, it's conforming. You just like the world. Anybody can do that. It doesn't take any transformation. You start acting that way. That's conform. Transforming, something's going on. Transform means God's up to something. Transform, there's a divine work in place. Transform is that idea when he says, hey, these promises of God, these magnificent, great, precious promises, you could participate in God's life with these. That's transformed. That's higher living. That's a higher call in our lives. It means I'm not going to operate by the old standard of wisdom. He gets into James a little bit farther down. He just about four verses later, he says, listen, the wisdom that is from above is first, it's pure, it's virtuous, it's peaceable, it's gentle, and it's easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. What's he saying? Man, if, if you're embracing true wisdom and true knowledge, it affects your life. You're a different man, you're a different person, you're a different woman. Your life changes. So we, we realize that, you know, that we need knowledge. We realize true knowledge is found in God. We realize there's a false knowledge that'll lead us astray every time. The mind's our battleground, you know. If, if we're gonna choose the word of God, then it's gonna mean a difference in our life, but it's a difference that will, literally God does a work in us with it. He starts moving in us by his Holy Spirit and starts creating change in our life. We start growing in grace. We find strength for living. We find peace in the midst of trials. We find comfort in the midst of our sorrows. Listen, we, we experience God. We're participating in the divine nature. But let me say this, please understand, it's, it's, it's faith and the virtue and the knowledge, all right? Knowledge in itself, it's a fifth point, is not sufficient. It's not just getting the information down, all right? Just knowledge by itself won't work. Let me, let me give you a, a, a little math problem here. There's faith, but if you don't add virtue, you minus virtue, but you add knowledge, faith, F minus V plus K, this is new math, <laughs> equals P, pride. There's a lot of arrogant people in our world who excluded faith, they've excluded virtue, and they have a lot of information. And it just leads to pride and arrogance. Paul warned about this in the church even. He said, listen, there's some of you, there's some of you who got knowledge down, but you've missed faith and virtue. He said, and because of that, he used the word, now you're puffed up. That's making fajitas Friday, this last weekend on my grill. I had some flour tortillas and you know, there's nothing worse in the world than flour tortillas that have been microwaved. Can I get a witness? And no matter what you do to them, it's just, it's just no worries. It's like 
like chewing old leather or something. So I thought, I'm going to grill these tortillas over here, you know. So I'm turning the meat and throwing flour tortillas over there. And I walk away for a minute, and I'm doing something else, and I realize, oh, I put them flour tortillas. They're all over there, you know, and they're all poof. I said, oh, Lord, we're going to have stuff fajitas, I guess, you know. I got a bowl of flour tortilla. But they're just popped. I thought, you know, that looks like a bunch of back row Baptists. No offense back to you folks back there, all right? <laughs> all sitting there on the grill. Listen, if we don't have a transforming work of the Holy Spirit in our life, in other words, there's no real faith. There's no commitment to this glorious knowledge of Jesus Christ and knowing him and adding to that, that virtue in our life, that commitment to purity and moral excellence in our life and adding knowledge to that. Then all we are, we just get, we get religious. We got a lot of information. We want to sit around and argue all the time about stuff that doesn't really mean a whole lot. You know, knowledge puffs up, the scripture says. Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifieth. All right, love. Where does that come from? It comes from faith and virtue. I think we need to understand that the well-rounded Christian is he receives knowledge, all right? He begins to think and act in two ways. One, conceptually. We get the concept. We realize what this is about. It's about knowing Christ. It's about, it's about partaking of the divine nature. It's about living the transformed life. There's a concept behind this knowledge. It's not just information for information's sake. We, we want to know God. We want to walk with God. You know, we want to hear God. We want to see God in our life. But it also is relation. That's what James was talking about. It affects what God's done something here. If it's a genuine work, then it, it works relationally. One relationship, I'm participating in the divine nature of God. Koinonia, fellowship with God. But also relationally in, with the body of Christ. I begin to relate to you. We begin to love one another. We begin to, to fellowship together. We have knowledge that says everybody here is messed up. <laughs> I know you're thinking, amen, almost. You think, yeah, everybody but me. <laughs> That's what we like to think, isn't it? Hey, we all have shortcomings. Amen. If you're looking for a church today that's perfect, man, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> we know we're not perfect. That's, that's where it means we're on the right road at least, all right? You say, well, what do you mean? L let me put it this way. Someone has defined knowledge like this. They said that uh, uh, knowledge is the process of passing from the unconscious state of ignorance to the conscious state of ignorance. <laughs> hey, we're in a conscious state of ignorance, all right? <laughs> we know we haven't arrived, but we know the answer and we're moving towards it, praise the Lord. In other words, ignorance doesn't know what it doesn't know. Is that, is that a little too bizarre? That's pretty simple though, isn't it? It doesn't know, but true knowledge does not know and knows it. <laughs> We know where we're lacking. We know the answers are out there, right? And we're seeking to know. We want to know more. We want to, but it's not just, again, knowledge for the information. Say, we want God to do a work in our hearts, our lives, and our world as he works in us and with us and through us. So we realize what we don't know. We want to know more. And we start pursuing. That's why I, I, I love that little comment my mom used to tell me. It's never too late to start doing the right thing. If you haven't been studying the word of God, get after it. If all you do is rely on somebody else to study the Bible for you, hey, and I enjoy that, studying it for you. I really do. But I feel like I'm getting all the good stuff and you're not getting much. You say, why? Because I'm not that good a communicator. I, you ought to see my notes. They look like they've been baptized. I'm spitting all over everything. Yeah. I, 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 I probably have misquoted a verse that was up on the screen. You know, I probably didn't give the right address. I probably said first when it said second on the screen. I, I know there'll be something because two or three of you will tell me. Boy, you really blew that page. You realize what you said? I know what you meant to say, but you said this. I'll catch it later when I listen. But hey, we're moving in the right direction. Amen. We have the source of true knowledge, so you need to embrace it. You need, if you don't have a time where you take the Word of God to believe and receive and study it yourself, you need to ask God to forgive you for that because He tells us very clearly, and this is not a suggestion, add to your faith virtue to your virtue knowledge. And he said, add it diligently. Get after it. That word spudo, which be to get after it. Make haste to get after it. Quit putting this off. Quit saying tomorrow I'm going to start doing this. Start doing it today. Quit, quit making excuses. Well, it's just hard for me to do it in the morning. Mom, it's hard for me to do it at night. I got, yeah, I got kids. I got, hey, be done with that. Mama had six kids. And we were all weird. You know, which one do you like most? I don't think she liked any of us. No. <laughs> she loved us all. But I have a feeling the like part was hard to do sometimes. 
always fighting, always, you know, challenging each other. You know, some of you think my kids are terrible. Don't play by Hey, they're all like that. <laughs> all right. They're little sinners by nature, but God's grace is what we see God move in their heart and life. All right. I love your kids too. All right. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. We got to get in the word. And I know for 25 years, those of you who have been in this church that long, 26, 27, you may be tired of hearing me say that, but I'm not going to stop saying it Amen. because we need to get in the Word. Amen? And when you get in the Word, you'll be able to turn on some of these TV preachers and say, oh, that, where you say, oh, that's great. You'll say, oh, that guy's an idiot. Amen? <laughs> Amen? Amen? You'll, you, you'll hear some preachers say, what is he talking about? And you'll agree with Hosea, God, your people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. And they just flock in like sheep, you know, to some of the dumbest stuff. It's because we don't know the word of God. Hallelujah. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word that you give.